And we are starting. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, for those who went to the Pi Fiorentina yesterday, it's Thursday, the 5th. We're in Florence. And we, we now have the pleasure to hear a uh, talk by Andrew Dockey. Who's, uh, who's been uh, a Python developer since nine, 1995. 97. And 97. 97. Oh, okay. <laughs> and we'll be talking about concurrent futures. So let's give you a hand. Thank you. So like you said, my name is Andrew Dahlke. I'm a consultant based in Gothenburg, Sweden. Though, as you may be able to tell from my accent, I am not Swedish. I should say, I am not Swedish. I live in, the, I'm from the U.S. I moved to Sweden about five years ago, a little over five years ago. Most of the text in my presentation is given at that URL there. It's actually, I wrote this as an essay for my blog site. Uh, it's the same URL as the top of here. Uh, a module, what I'm going to talk about today is this thing called concurrent futures. It was added to Python 3.2 by Brian Quinlan, at least that's the name that's in the uh, email, uh, email address that's inside the uh, attributions. And then it was backported. And then it was uh, backported by uh, Alex Grunholm to Python 2.6 and 2.7. Now I am one of the great unwashed masses that's still using Python 2. I do chemistry software, and all the chemistry software I work with is still working only for Python 2. The Swig and Blue stuff hasn't yet supported Python 3 like we need, at least as far as I know of. So the, what is the concurrent futures? Why is it there? We've already got the multi-threaded and multi-processing code. Why do we need some other way to do multi-threaded or multi-processing code? And you can read PEP 3148, which describes the details. This student says, basically what it's saying here is, it's too complex for the simple case of set up a thread pool or set up a process pool. There's no standard API, so people who are working on their projects that need thread pools or process pools are making their own. And because each one has their own different API, that means if you have one library that uses a thread pool, another library that uses a thread pool, and you want one thread pool that's shared between the two, you can't do so because each does its own thing. So you can read the PEP 3. Uh, 3148 description of why that's the case, why they want to do this. In my presentation today, I'm going to go through a few examples of how to use multi-threaded and multi-processing through concurrent.futures using the as a guided um, problem web log analysis. So I've got, in this case, 169 files on my website, each one for one day. And that file contains a bunch of records. This is one line long in combined long format, but I couldn't fit on one slide as one line, which contains IP address, the date, the uh, HTTP request, including the path it went through, and some other information. And I want to analyze this for various things. Now, there are 1.3 some odd million records in here, so it does take a little while. Uh, but if I want single-threaded program, this is typically how you write this in Python. Uh, go look at all the files that are www.whatever.gz. For each of those files, use the gzip, um, gzip module, open that file, uncompresses, and read it as a file iterator. And of course, the file iterator returns lines at a time. So what I want to do is just count the number of accesses of anything. GIF files, PNG, CSS, HTML, whatever it is on my site, how many of those accesses I got per day, which means I need to read the number of lines in a file. So once I've opened the file, I just want the count of how many lines there are. This here is, I think, somewhat a roundabout way to do it, but it's the most Pythonic way to do it, is to count the number of elements inside of an iterator. You iterate over each one, you get the value of one for each time. You get the sum of all those ones, and you get the size of the iterator. Because length, len, works fine for containers, but it doesn't work for iterators. So if you want to get the length of an iterator, I think this is the typical Pythonic way to do it. Anyway, open the file, read through all the lines, get its size. And then um, at the end, I pull out the file name, just get the date, get the result as a column of dates, the timestamp, and the counts. That gives me this thing here on the left, which is pretty hard to interpret because it's just a bunch of numbers. And I could think for a while, but what I did was went over to matplotlib and asked it to plot it. And you can see here the plot, it's pretty, it's a nice weekly variation. People on the weekends don't go to my site as often as during the week. And so it's up and down, up and down. And just before I did this pay, uh, thing in January, I think an essay of mine went on Hacker News. And so there's that spike there at the end because of Hacker News. Uh, the matplotlib code is actually this part right here at the bottom of what, five lines or so. And import pylab, make a plot where the x-axis is all of the dates and the y-axis is the counts. And so this is the entire code to make the previous, well, make the graph of the previous slide. 
I simple, I clean it up a little bit. I pull it out into a, I pull it out to its own function, account lines given a file name, and I had to do some things to parse the file name so I can get the, the date as an actual Python date time. Is there a, a pointer, laser pointer, or a wooden stick? Okay, center button. Ooh, good. Uh, so I do a bit of stuff to get a date time and put the date. And then I have here a list of dates, a list of counts for each of the file names, call the count lines function that gets back the date and time, and I want to turn these pairs of date time, a whole bunch of those, into a list of dates and a list of um, counts. Now, if you're a more advanced Python program, you might say you can use zip of splat or whatever, but I think that's kind of too complex to read to just look at it. Anyway, so this single-threaded makes a nice graph at the end. The problem is it's slow. Well, it's not really slow. It's five and a half seconds to read, what, 1.3 million lines. So it's pretty fast, but I have a four-processor machine, and I thought, well, I, I'm wasting three processors. I should make it useful. So the first thing I think of, and probably anyone else thinks of, is threads. What about thread programming? And you've all heard about the GIL, but maybe this is a case where the GIL is not a problem. I'm doing file I.O. File I.O. releases the GIL. And maybe the, a lot of time is being spit in C code for the GZIP library. Maybe it's OK. So I want to use threads and see what happens. And the way to do this typically is to make a thread pool. So a thread pool is you set up a bunch of jobs. These are going to be things like analyze this file, analyze this file. So you have a whole lot of list of jobs to do. And then you have a couple of threads of operation, in this case two threads. And each thread is saying, well, I have nothing to do. I'll grab the first job and start working with it. And the second one says, well, I have nothing to do either. I'll grab the next job and start working with it. First job is done, gets the next one. Done, gets the next one. Well, this one is done, gets the next one. So these things are, one, each thread of operation is working with things, and when it's done, it grabs the next thing out the work, off the work queue. So when you have a job pool, like, to, to make a job pool like this, from what I had before, it's actually just a few lines of code. There is the import concurrent features, and there's this bit of new stuff right here. So this, you can see, is a context manager inside of with statement. <laughs> Now what this is going to do is set up a thread pool with two workers and call that the executor. And I can use the executor in different ways. And here I use the map function. So executor map applies that function, all the things inside the thread pool, and gets the results and work with it. And this with statement, when it finishes, is when the thread pool is finished. So this with statement will not continue until all of the jobs are done. Is there any, is, who here is happy with understand, their understanding of how Python's map function works? Uh, good, because not everybody is. That means I can use the next slide. Python's map function, and there's a good number of people here that did, so. Um, Python's map function has been around since the days of Python 1, but the typical way in Python programming to do this sort of thing is either a loop, like I did before, which is iterate over all elements, all, all characters, and append, in this case, the ASCII value to that um, list. And the result is a list of, L of uh, ASCII values. More modern Python, modern like the last 10 years, uh, is to use list comprehension. And that gives you the same thing, a list like this. Another way to do this is using a functional programming style, or also called a higher order function, where this function takes another function and applies that function to each of the parameters inside of here. But all three of these in Python 2 give you the same answer. In Python 3, it's a bit different because this returns back an iterator instead of a list. But in Python 2.x, they're all identical. So I can go back to the code that I had originally which is um, this bit of stuff up here, and me almost mechanically modify it to use Python's map function like this. So this function applies to each file name, returns back the uh, date and count. Here I'm using the tuple assignment directly inside the for loop, and then append and append to each of the lists to turn it from a list of two element tuples into two lists of one for one type, one for another type. And then to convert that code into the thread pool is basically a matter of making the thread pool executor and then calling executor.map. And as a result, I now have a multi-threaded version of the same code. So the question is, is, is it faster? The answer is no. In fact, every time I add a new, pro every time I new add, thread, add a thread to the pool, it gets slower. And this is saying that there's a shared resource someplace in here. Now, it could be the gil. It could, again, be something with the disk I.O. Machine, machine, I don't know. But what I can do is switch this from using multi-threaded code to using multi-process code by changing that. Instead of thread pool executor, it's now process pool executor. Everything else here is identical. But instead of using a thread pool, I now have different processes. Now, you can't do this with all things because 
what it's doing is it's turning your request into a, into a pickle object that sends to the, ser the sense of the process, which does the work and sends the result back to the pickles. So your data types have to be pickleable, and there can't be a lot of data overhead because otherwise you're just going to be spending all your time doing pickles. Uh, but in this case, I have very small amounts of data going back and forth, all pickleable, and the work I'm doing is pretty high overhead. So when I do this, one change, I get good performance. So I add a thread, and it gets, uh, I should say this is not thread, these are processes. Add uh, one process, one process is 5.6 seconds, a bit slower because that's to the process, uh, the original was 5.5 seconds. But two threads is faster, three threads is faster, and four threads is faster still. It's not linear speed up. If I had linear speed up, I should expect to see 1.1 seconds instead of 2.6 seconds. But it's still better, I'm making more speed performance. Is that a question? Or just, yeah. Hi. I have been using not just the feature, but the multiprocessor module for a long time. I have, and it's interesting because this kind of linear scaling doesn't always map directly to the number of processes we think mm -hmm. we have, mostly because many of the Intel processors, for example, we have hyper 3 thin and the like. The hyper 3 thin is not a real extra proce processor. It just makes very inter in smart things to speed up. Um, if there is only the Python um, process that are working in that computer, it usually doesn't work. The, most, uh, the simple example is you have, for example, an i5 processor with two cores, but both of them have hyper processor. Just use the um, true process for the pool, and it will scale perfectly. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting because it's commerce, um, it looks like you have four processors, the pool thread thinks they have since the operating system answers that, but they are not real different processors. Yes. So the uh, question, the comment seems to be that that is they the expected behavior. Yes. Since the three and the fourth threads are not real processors because they don't, they cannot map to real different processors. Right. But even if you have real processors, this sort of thing, you see this sort of thing. I did some work for a client where they had real, 16 real processors, but we could get most tenfold speed up out of it because there's other contention overhead that the OS is doing. It's not so, yeah, there's data process, there's all the talks to the file system, there's other things going on besides just the Python processing. So this is characteristic across just about every single uh, multiprocessing system I've used. So oh, thank that was the second compared to the question. Uh, so here I said that the time for one thread took 5.5, for fault processing took 5.6 seconds. I did some more analysis, and the answer, the problem is, is the, the gil is the problem, and it's in the gzip library. The gzip library is using uh, Python code to do a lot of the managing of the C, and so it's lots of in Python, and it looks like the, uh, the gzip uncompression, the zip uncompression, zlib uncompression, doesn't release the gil. So even though it's stuck in C doing stuff, I think it's still some problems there. So if anybody here is interested in working at the gzip library to make it faster, I'm sure many people in the world would love to have a better a GZIB performance. Because here what I did was instead of using the, Z, the GZIB library, um, GZIP library, what I did was I called out, I said, I'm on a Unix machine, I can call it the GZCat, have it do all the work for me, and then even pass that work over, the output of that, pipe it into WC, and get the number, number of lines and just read the file. So Python code now is just saying read line of the end, when, one line of all the data. When I do that, my performance is much higher. So I think that there is some optimizations that people could do to the um, gzip module to make it faster at reading these things, because right now it's about not quite half the performance of reading an external process, which seems a bit silly. So if there's anybody here willing to do this, probably the t go talk to the core developers. So this analysis I've done so far has been take a file, count the number of lines, plot it. It's kind of a boring analysis. I want to know on my site what, is, what are the most commonly accessed URLs or most commonly accessed paths. Um, Log file, again, is in this format. And the part of that that's interesting is I want this uh, readings diary, diary RSS XML, that part of it. And there's lots of different ways to parse it. Uh, I decided to do it in stages, break on the quotes, get this field. That gives me a bunch of a list. And I get the second element, break that on, um, I get the second element, break that on the white space here, and I get the actual path. But I could probably have just done this as break on space and get field number 12 or so. So different ways to process this. This is the first one I came up with. Uh, so this gives, this gives me the path. And now what I want to do is find like the most common 10 elements in the path. Find the most common 10 element, sorry, find the 10 most common paths. 
There's a great module in Python 2.7. It's an earlier pod as well as called, called Collections. In 2.7, there was a new class added to that called Counts. And what Counts does is it helps you do counts of just like this. If you're in earlier Pythons, you might have used a uh, dictionary for this or a default dictionary as well. But this is really optimized for this sort of count the number of things in, that you have. So here I have a string, count the number of characters in the initializer, and E is four times, L is two times, and so on and so on. It also has the ability when you take two counters and add them together, it will count add the, it would add the values together. And here you see a method of saying most common, so give me the most common four elements inside the um, counter. Uh, so I can combine these two together in a single-threaded program uh, to do this. Import the, import the counter, initialize it to nothing, parse all the lines of the files, put the field I want, and counter path plus equals 1. So if it doesn't exist, it sets the value to 0, plus equal 1, so it, the first one is going to give you 1, and so on and so on. And the end result, I say give me the 10 most common things, and I find a very boring answer. I find that the most common path on my site is the fav icon. Then there's my RSS feed, but everything else is pretty much the CSS and the GIF that's on every single page. Uh, and then the home page in robust.txt. So this isn't very interesting. So I'm going to modify this code a bit to give me better information. First off, I'm going to take it, right now it takes about nine seconds to run. I'll see if I can make it faster. I know the glib library, the, G, the gzip log library is a problem if I use multi-threaded, so I'll just go right off and use multi-processing. Uh, in my main process, I'll a thread pool. It will say things like, please compute count URLs of some file name. Go back over the process pool, do this work, come back. Only this time it's going to return back a new counter. I'll take this counter, add it to the counter that's in the main process, and sum those up so at the end result I have the merged counter of the entire system. This is MapReduce. Here is the map running through all these things, and the reduce is the merger into one single data structure. So I have to make the split up. There's a worker function like this on the top. The worker function, uh, make the counter, read the, read the lines, get the field, and add that to the count, add the counts to the counter. That gets sent back as a pickle to the main thread. The main thread here starts the process pool with four workers. And then for each worker, submits that, does its work. And then here you see this is the main counter, update the worker counter. So that says that, okay, if there's been the path, a fave icon exists 200 times in the um, worker thread, and already exists 500 times in the main thread, add them together, and it'll do the 700 for me. So this is why the counter class is really nice for doing this sort of work, because it does all that stuff, all that hard work, well, not really hard work, all that finicky work for you already. So I did this with a process pool with four processes, and it, takes, it was about twice as fast. So pretty good. I mean, not great, but good enough. Well, not really good enough, because I could still go back to use the GZ cat instead of, G, instead of uh, the Python code for that. So I do that. And I also find out the HTML. And the result is now I'm down to 3.2 seconds to find that uh, some code I wrote over Christmas about a year, no, 10 years ago, for doing a RSS, making RSS feeds is the most common thing on my site, which I find kind of interesting. Because you see, also there's much of stuff I did for training down in South Africa, the Bioinformatics Network, where uh, it's just basics of how to do these th things. And people go come to my site to find the training stuff I do, like this class I'm doing, uh, class, this, um, lecture I'm doing now. And nothing on here is really the stuff I do for a living, which is chemical informatics. But then there's like maybe 200 people in the world that are interested in that stuff. So first thing I showed you was to show you, was to just count the number of files, the uh, number of lines in a file. Now what I've shown you is to do the count of looking for HTML um, records inside of my files. The next thing I had is, well, how, where are people coming from to read my site? Are any of my possible customers, which are typically biotech and pharmaceutical companies, looking at my website? And to do that, I have to resolve a host name. So the log file just contains IP addresses like this, which I can't look at and say what that is. Instead, use a socket module, get fully qualified domain name, take that, and you get back this. This is the site that the planet.python.org aggregator comes from. So it's going through finding everybody's RSS feeds, pulling them together, and giving you that nice page at Planet Python. Um, but it's coming from dinsdale.python.org. So I know that this is where the, um, where that, where I know who's, I know why this IP address exists. When I do this from a cold cache, DNS lookup takes about 0.2 seconds, which I guess in one sense surprised me, but then I'd heard about like Google Chrome does the prefetch of the host name, because 0.2 seconds starts to be pretty noticeable when you have to do lots of lookups. 
Um, and so if I have 117,000 of them, that's going to take six and a half hours. And this is a case where basically my computer could be running 100 of these things at a time and not worry about it because it's going, come on, 0.1 seconds, where have you been? 0.2, ah, finally it comes back. So my computer is waiting around. There's no thread contention. There's no nothing. So I can run a lot of processes, except for I have a Mac. And it turned out that get FQDN uses get host by adder, and as far as I can tell on a Mac, that's single-threaded. I am not a network person. I use Python because it takes care of the stuff for me. I think this is the code where it says acquire a lock and then release lock after it's done the lookup. If there's anybody here who wants to figure out why does a Mac is single-threaded, because the documentation says it's thread safe, please go ahead and do it. But I couldn't do that. I just said, well, I can't use multiple threads for this, so I'll use multiple processes instead. And because I'm using the concurrent futures, which has that as a simple function, I can just go ahead and do that. So I want to go and take all the IP addresses I have in my log files and then pass them through the get, host, get fully qualified domain name and work with it. And of course, if I have an IP address, I don't want to make the query multiple times. Instead, I'm just going to get the unique IP addresses that are, that are in my set, or in my uh, log files. So this is the kind of characteristic way that you would do that. Here I'm parsing the files and getting the IP address but I only want the unique IP addresses. So what you do is you make a set, empty set, set that to um, variable scene. This is the, typically you call it scene. Go through, get the IP addresses. If you haven't seen it before, yield it. So then the caller from this gets the new unique IP address. And now that you've seen it and used it, add this to the list of scene elements. So keep, throwing in the, keep going through and through and through, and this will return back only the unique elements that are inside, of, or the unique IP addresses that are inside the log files. Then on the user side, on my, uh, the rest of the API side, I guess, I can just pass this in, get unique IP addresses for a list of file names, and work with it. But during testing, I don't want to spend multiple hours, whatever it might be, to uh, do the analysis. So I actually use this uh, nice other thing from Intertools, iSlice. If you have a list, like with uh, 100 elements, you can say square bracket 10 colon 20, and that will give you the sublist from 10 to 20. You can't do that with iterators. Instead, you use this iSlice thing which will go through and read the first, in this case, 1,800 and just drop it on the floor, and then give you the next 100 back. So this is a way to say, give me the sub-iterator that's just this range of the full iterator. And so for testing, I could say, give me a few hundred at a time. I can do the testing, see that it works. And then what happens is now it's the DNS cache. And so I would have to drop that, up the numbers a little bit, so I can work on the next 100, next 100, next 100. And this, the fact that I ended up at 1,800 means I did this at least 18 times. So it took a while to get all the code right uh, to figure out, because this is my first experiment on how to use this package. Anyway, so Intertools iSlice is a nice little feature I wanted to show you about. Now that you have all these IP addresses, what you could do is use the map function like I, did, like I showed you before. You could say map, do look up all these things, get the results. It would work, but I think it's not uh, computationally, but philosophically the wrong approach to do it. And for two reasons. One is, in a technical sense, you lose a bit of the information this returns back a host name, and I still want to associate with the IP address because later on I want the host name to the number of times that host name comes in. There's technical ways around that. I'm actually going to use that hack later on. But the other is that this map guarantees the result order. And for this, and also for the HTML counter I showed you in the previous example, I don't need to have the order preserved. This map is going to say, return back the first element first, the second element second, and third element third, and so on. But all I care about is the data, and I can merge that data myself, because uh, I don't care about the order. So instead of using the map function, I'll use what the map function actually does. Map function underneath calls this a submit function. And submit, I'll show you this, uh, this function in a moment, takes a function and the arguments for, it, for that function. So it's very much like a uh, apply would be in Python code. And then when the executor is ready, it will call that function with those arguments as that. And we turn back this new thing called the future. And that's actually where the name of this thing comes from. By the way, if you're used to um, jQuery, this something like this in jQuery, C++ promises are also in the same sort of style of programming. Uh, twisteds, deferreds are similar as well. It turns back this object, this future object, that I'll assign to job. Now the thing is, is what can you do with a future object? And the, the idea of, the, of this concept is that you return back a future object that says, when you want this, call uh, result. When you call result, I will give you what that result is. So submit returns right away, even though it hasn't finished. But it says that when you want this later on, call the result, and I'll give it to you. And even if it's not ready, at that point, it will block. 
So job result will block until it's ready or until the timeout is reached. Uh, so you may think, well, maybe that's good. I can start a job and then do some other stuff and then wait for the job to come back. But what's really useful is to have this, how this ties into the rest of the system. Because most of the time, like in my case here, you might have a thousand different jobs that you're waiting to get done. And you don't care what the order is. You just say, when the next one is completed, give it to me and I can work with it. And with that, you use this futures as completed function. So this is a list of jobs here. Whatever order is, it actually is in the iterable of jobs. Whenever it's finished, whenever one's finished, you get it back on the iterator, no matter the order that it happened. Uh, and then I can call the job, get job request. This won't block because I know that it's already there. And I assign it to my values and I print it out. The whole slide, all the pieces together, except for it's kind of useless to show how to get the unique IP addresses and the imports, is I have a function that uh, called resolve, fully qualified domain name, that's used here. Call this, get the job, append it to the job. Here I now have all the list of jobs that are set up. And then uh, use as completed, get the jobs, get the result. The only thing that's missing is description of resolve, fully qualified domain name, get the IP address, and actually return back the IP address and the fully qualified domain name. It's a bit of a hack. I'll show you some ways to get around that hack later on. Uh, and it's pretty good scale up too. 50 processes running. I get 90 per second compared to one process where it gives me 5 per second. Uh, and this is highly variable because some of these answers are in 2.2 seconds. Some take 8 seconds to resolve in some DNS server somewhere in the world. Now I said this resolve FQDN thing is a bit of a hack because it's got this, I'll go back to it. It's got this thing where the input parameter is also one of the output parameters. And that just doesn't feel nice. Um, so really what you should do is what the documentation for the concurrent module suggests which is to set the job information inside of a dictionary. So you set the job. Here I'm using the actual socket get FQDN. Put that back in the job. And then it's mapping from the job to information you want to keep about the job. So now it's no longer going to, say, a client and back, doing nothing on the client. It's uh, staying here on the server. And then I can do whatever I want with it. When it's completed, I pull back that job. I get the information. And I continue on processing like usual. So this is actually a documented preferred way to handle that case. The problem is, is the problem with this approach, though, is that you have latency. So I ran this finally, got the code working, ran it for my 100 and some odd, whatever it was, uh, 1,000 IP addresses. And it started running. And no output. I expected output. Hit Control C, realized I had waited like eight seconds or so. It has still submitting jobs, because it's having to parse the entire, all the G, all log files, submit all the jobs first before it starts giving any responses. So it's submitting all the jobs and finally responding and doing stuff. And I broke it somewhere in here. So even though the threads have already been working and resolving things, I made sure it was actually resolving things, it just hadn't got to the part where it started re reporting that. The way around that is, unfortunately, uh, to use callbacks. I say unfortunately because you heard various people, including Guido on Monday, talk about that callback programming is a bit more complicated and you have to think of things a different way. But when you do that, here you see I have the job, I submit the job, and I add done callback. This will actually call this function right away if it's already done, maybe, or at some point very soon after it's completed. Um, and then this, I'm going back to the hack I did before where I keep the job information. So print mapping takes the IP address fully qualified domain name and prints that out. This is actually shorter code than we had before, but if you're using multi-threaded programming, you have to worry more about, for instance, uh, putting locks on shared resources. Uh, and I also had to go back to this hack because I couldn't use that dictionary to make the nice association between a job and the, re the results. There are ways to remove the hack. I think the right way to do it is, well, I say the right way. If you're going to be doing callbacks, you're probably used to functional, using functions all the time. So if you're using callbacks, you probably the best way is to use the func tools partial. Who here is, enjoys using func tools partial or knows a lot about it? You can see it's a lot fewer than map. Um, so what the func tools does is gives you, I, I can't even actually explain it. I know how it works, but I don't have a good way of explaining it. So I do explain it by code. If you have a function like this, add two parameters, uh, add one and five, you get six. What add one does is it fills in the first part of that automatically, so you can call it with the, just the rest of the call parameters. So add one goes to this function and says add, well, all one's already there, so that's the first field for x. And then 5 is the second thing, and it gives the result. So add 1 to 5 gives you 6. Add 1 to 10 gives you 11. So it's the same as defining, it's roughly the same as defining this, this sort of function. 
And I go through the details of how it happens. And it's like, you do this, and it wraps this way, and there's a way around it. And if you like functional programming, go look at the Funk Tools module. It does things like this. If you're going to be doing callback programming, you should probably also know how the Funk Tools module works. Um, otherwise, these slides will be online. The end result is I have an idea of how many people are using my site from different companies or different uh, hosts. And there's the um, Python aggregator there, Planet Python aggregator, Artema aggregator there. I have no idea who that address is. It doesn't resolve. And um, there's a couple. There's Novo Nordisk here and Biogen. So there's a few people who are potential customers that do read my blog, which makes me think, hmm, if I can make them, get them to pay, pay me money for this. Anyway, so I've been using the, um, I've got five minutes left, so I can go to the next slides. So I've been, I started using this not to do log file analysis, but for some things that I've been doing with, I need to do multiple, uh, work with multiple processes and, or multiple tasks and get them done. Last spring, I started uh, experimenting with this system called PyCloud. It's a commercial company that sits on top of the Amazon, Amazon services, but gives you a very Python interface for working with, with a code. So this is their demo um, example, where you have a Python function called cloud.call with a function and the parameter. It will run it on the cloud. It will actually take your environment, all your .py files, make a copy of that on the cloud, spin up something that's on a system that they probably have already running, and then run your Python. It will pick all your arguments, send it there, and then run the code and come back. So you don't have to worry about setting up the environment uh, unless you have some, like, say, specialized C extensions you want installed. And it gives you the results. So if you're doing things that have low data overhead, because after all, you're going to an Amazon site someplace, and a lot of compute time, which is most of what you do in scientific programming, then this might be a good thing. And I played around with it, because I had um, 25 billion of things I do in chemistry, sports matches to do. And I said, go ahead and run this using this sort of map uh, approach. It took two, points, two days and a bit of CPU time but because they happened to have 113 processors that were just hanging around, that meant I was done in about 48, yeah, 48 minutes. And this is showing you the parallelism that was going on because this was strictly a map job, not even a reducer. In fact, it was longer to download the data at the end over my 3G connection to my laptop, my desktop at home than it was to actually run all this data. But their API looks like this. Um, it's this call cloud with these parameters, and then you get a bunch of job IDs and you join later on. So it's kind of a traditional way of doing this programming. I like, the Python, I like this concurrent style, though, where you have the executor. So this is my proposed thing is executor, say, run this type of machine at Amazon in this environment, and then just submit the job executor. And then the executor is going to finish. Once it's finished, you know that all the jobs are done. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to convince them that they should look to use, look at the concurrent um, futures and use the same sort of API, so therefore you can have code that migrates easy from one sort of mechanism to another. It's not going to be perfect, because the website includes the ability to look at a job by its label. So it's not exactly a perfect thing. And uh, I think I have like one minute, two minutes left. And the other thing, I, and actually the reason why I started looking at this is because in doing chemistry work, I have a large dependency network of different properties I want to compute. Now this is going much more into the field that I work in full time, is you might be doing a thing where there's a consensus prediction, which is the result of other predictions. Those depend on some physical properties that you've predicted, or maybe you have a database in place. Um, or it might involve a web service, so you come back and do it. And those depend in turn on, say, eventually it comes down to someone drew a molecule on a screen somewhere. But that has to be cleaned up and put in the correct form. So this large dependency network, of which I'm only showing you a small segment of the 10,000 or so rules that I did for one client of all the possible things you might want to compute. And what I've, been do what I've done normally in Python is there's a function that basically resolves, calls another function, calls another function, and so on. So I'm using the um, recursion basically for this, which is good except that it's a single, th single thread. And I've been looking at using some asynchronous method to handle the large dependency system. And here I sketch a way to do this that I've been using with the futures, which is basically using callbacks, enough things have happened to trigger the next event and trigger the next event, and connect that up to a, uh, connect that up to a callback pool. So this is the place where I'm looking at using this. And I've, been, I've, liked what I've, used, well, I've, I've liked what I've done so far. And this is actually the main reason why Python 3, one of the reasons why Python 3 is good for this, is that Python 3 has, oops, Python 3 has, sorry, because if you're using twisted with deferreds, you could do this already. All the stuff that I'm showing you with features exists already as an API. But Python 3 adds exception chaining. 
And what that means is I have here on the top an exception. This exception is caught by another thing which says, ooh, there was a problem. And I can continue on the chain and say, well, this exception was caused by some exception elsewhere. So the result is, oh, this exception happened because this exception happened. And so if you go back to here, then I can say, I could not compute this thing because there was a problem here because there was a problem here. And I can give them then, by, in Python 3's exception chain, give a full report of what that is. And that's something that I could not do with the existing 2.x series. So I'm looking forward to having more people using the Concurrent Futures API and in Python 3 so that I can be able to do this sort of uh, dependency network. So we have five minutes for questions. One question. So I was just wondering, is the processing support in uh, this package a little less hacky than the one in multiprocessing? Or is, is it the same kind of deal with having to be able to import the main library and stuff like that? Sorry, or is it, I didn't hear the last part. Um, you have to do, you have to make sure that your, the file that you're running in is importable because that's basically what the multiprocessing thing does. You're talking about the main function? Yeah, I think so. But it's, it's going to be the same problem, is that you have to have Python somehow get the function in the first place. And so you have this reference and you have to depickle it. And so I think it's not a hack, it's just it's the way that things are. Uh, there was one slide where I, I missed what you were saying. Um, Only one? Well, probably others, but um, it was, because I didn't quite get it, I can't say which one it was. It was where you had, um, you were making the mapping and you were, you were putting ah, something in. This one? Yes, the, the next one. Oh, after this, to the right? Yeah. That one? Uh, yeah, I, so I didn't have, didn't quite. Okay, so the problem to. here is I was saying, I was running with the hundred and some odd thousand different jobs. So I'm having to read the gzip file, get all the unique IP addresses, submit those, and I submit them into one job queue. And so I'm submitting and submitting and submitting, and I, it, it, after eight seconds, I was like, there's no output. I should expect to see something by now. I could see that my jobs are being run, because I could put a print statement inside the worker, worker processes. But I wasn't getting any results. And I eventually figured out it was because I'm still adding things to the job queue. So even though there's results ready, I haven't gotten down here to re where I report it. And so because of this lack of the slower latency, this fact that I'm waiting eight seconds before I get the first result was when I switched to, well, maybe I should use the callback approach, where as soon as a job is done, I can get a trigger that says, this job is done, and do something with it, so that I can still be loading and running at the same, running at the same time. Sorry, loading and reporting results at the same time. Right, OK, yeah, I get it. And if anybody is also wondering, I've got, um, what's happened is you can look at the top of doo -doo -doo. You can look at the top of the process implementation, and you see it actually has a background thread on the, and when you have multiprocessing code, it has a background thread that's handling all this I.O. Okay, we have the time for the last question. Oh, a note and the question, I, among the first slides, uh, there was one where you had uh, 5.5 seconds with one process, and you expected in the ideal case to have 1.1 seconds with four processes. It doesn't seem quite right from a mathematical um, point of view. May, I may have done my math wrong. It was uh, this one here. This right? one, yeah. Four and times, uh, ah, you're right. 5.6 divided by 4 is not 1.1. So I did my math wrong. Yeah, anyway. But the real question was, uh, you say, yeah, there was a, there's a threading backhand and the process backhand, and you were trying to convince the PyCloud guys to use the same API for their own work. So I haven't yet, I've only done it once so far. I haven't really pushed them. Yeah, of course. But uh, do you think it would be uh, useful to have also Twisted as a backhand so we can use the same notation and have it executed by Twisted? Sure. Um, Someone could easily do an adapter for that. But the twisted, the twisted chaining and this way of chaining are actually not as close together as you might think, because in twisted you have the ability then to have the results go to other things, and it's a different style of 
way of thinking the same thing. So perhaps yes, but I think the Twisted people are the right one to say yes or no on that. Maybe when they move to Python 3, that'll be part of their um, changes. Okay, so thank you, Andrew. So the next talk will start in five minutes. And I re remember that all the videos are online and uh, you can check out at files.ep.